And I want everybody now, bringing right up to the microphones, to give a strong slave theater ovation to our friend, our comrade, our journalist, Joe Bragg. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, Alton has said it all because I've been, all of you here know my history, so I don't have to go into that. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute inside the courtrooms with uh, Attorney Maddox and all of the other warriors out there. And I've tried to tell you from your perspective what the story was about. And I received my walking papers on the 26th. The, the general manager said, we don't need a city hall reporter anymore. We don't need an outside reporter to tell us about the breaking news stories. This is a, a music station. We have more news reporters than most news stations in the city. And the only three of us, Bob Slade, Ann Tripp, and me, but the first radio station that I worked for in this city in 1968, WHN, was a music station. We had news from 6 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. That was a major white station at 400 Park Avenue. I was their only outside reporter. And because they hated John Lindsay so much, they would send me to City Hall and to Grayson Mansion at every time that represented the country the, the, uh, the company, and um, Robert Lowry, then the fire commissioner for John Lindsay, thought I was in, in Lindsay's cabinet. <laughs> and I was a news reporter covering the story for the station. So uh, I've been there from Lindsay through Giuliani. He was my fifth mayor, but they nipped it in the bud after I covered him a year and a month. And uh, I, he may have had something to do with it because I didn't give him any... Uh, flowering uh, uh, stories, I had to tell it the way I saw it. It was always from a black perspective. Whatever he did, it was from a black point of view that I reported from City Hall. And uh, just a few weeks ago, um, I had been parking in City Hall Plaza for all these years, so he gave me a letter saying that from now on it'll cost you $150 a month to park in City Hall. That's equivalent and you'd have to declare it on the income tax. And you had to turn it into your station. I think they said that all of the reporters got the same thing, but uh, the company that I worked for, they probably knew that I was going to be dismissed. So they called downtown and said, well, we're not going to put this on his W-2 form because it's just for this one year. And they probably knew that then. I didn't know it then, but uh, they dismissed that. But this is the kind of thing that we have at City Hall. Uh, the mayor is a um, very insensitive man. And uh, for the first time in my career, I got into a shouting match with the mayor, and I thought, well, it's time for me to go. Because <laughs> I was in the back of the room, and I was shouting at him about the, the, the remark that John Dyson made. And I've known John Dyson, and he served in the Kerry administration. And, you know, he was a long time. And, um, and I was incensed over it, and I thought the mayor should have, should have uh, said something about that, but he, he won't. He wouldn't do that. So I said, I'm not going to get in a shot and match with this man. He's not going to change his mind. Uh, with, with Ed Koch, who was, you all know, at least you could talk to him because he was a politician. He was a congressman from, from the liberal part of, of, um, of the village, and you knew that you could talk to him, regardless of his, his lifestyle or whatever, you could talk to him, but you can't talk to this man. When he makes up his mind, that's, that's it. He's not going to change his mind. But getting back to uh, Emmis Broadcasting, who now owns KISS FM, they own Hot 97, the same station here in the city, so they have two. And um, they told me they were downsizing the news department when they said they were not going to renew my contract. Fine. But when you downsize uh, the news department and then tell you that we really don't need to cover these breaking stories, as far as I'm concerned, it was an insult, like Mr. Maddox said, an insult to all of us. Uh, it was a slap in the face. And uh, so I walked out of there and immediately walked down to my lawyer's office. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, when I got my walking papers, he got his at 5. 
<laughs> but we had the story out there. We had news releases all over the place, and my colleagues in Room 9 had, had um, interviewed me, and it was in the newspapers and on television. They had to respond. They didn't expect that to happen within this two hours after they dismissed me at 11 o'clock. I was talking to my colleagues, and they came, they, they stepped up, and they wrote stories in the papers, and they put it on the radio and, and on television. But we are in a serious, I want to take one more minute, a serious situation in the United States of America, in New York City. Black folks are in trouble. I had the honor to travel to Rwanda during the summer with Minister Brown and Reverend Sharpton and his entourage. And I saw firsthand for the first time, because when I went there to Africa the first time with Mayor Dinkins, it was under a different circumstance. But this time in Rwanda, when I saw what they were doing to our people over there, and they have no respect for them no more than they have for us over here, I saw it from a different point of view. There is definitely, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a genocidal move going on to get rid of all of us. And before I left Rwanda, I found out that 35% of those people there have AIDS. And then when you talk to Dr. Jack Feld, it was, it was originated right here in Manhattan, in New York City. So we, what we're doing, we created this problem to what? Get rid of black people, not only here in the United States, but abroad. And right now in New York City, we have more young folks who are dying from AIDS than any other disease. That's documented. So what bothered me most of all was that they have cut off your flow of information from City Hall uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I, there are a couple of black reporters still left there at City Hall, but they're not covering the stories the way we did. Uh, I couldn't get anybody to go with me to Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago to cover the, the Kevin Laborde story. So I was out there, and I covered that story. And I saw how this young 13-year-old kid was beaten up at the schoolhouse. But then I came back and I said, Some, is, there's a problem here at the school. There's no learning going on. Our parents are not out here raising sand like they should be. If they were at that school, there wouldn't be a problem the way it is now with these teachers and with the kids roaming the halls, not learning when they should be learning. We have a, we have a lot of work to do. And um, um, uh, as that Earl Caldwell, and Dave Hardy, and Lutrice Leeds, and others before me been, 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 been silenced, Herb Boyd been fired from Amsterdam News. It's, it's serious. And so um, I'm not worried about a job. I'll, I'll probably pop up somewhere else, but I may not have the same vehicle to give you strong analysis on these stories like you should. Bill Clinton has already created $20 billion for Mexico, but you know what the money's going for. Not for the Mexican peso. You have the American corporation who went belly up down there. And the 20 billion is going down there to bail them out. So we have a problem. They will take 20 billion to Mexico, but they don't have a billion dollars to keep the programs going on here. These are our tax dollars that they're using. And we're going to have to do something about it. Just like uh, Mr. Maddox said, if we don't do something about it, no one else will. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Write the letters. Appreciate it. Just, we're just going to give them hell. We're not going to quit without a fight. Thank you so much. Joe Bragg, Joe Bragg, let me say uh, in conjunction with that, we have passed out an announcement. You should not roll that announcement up and put it up under your seat. You should take that announcement home because it has the address of the new crackers who own KISS FM. And you should join me. I'm getting my letter out right now. That's only the first volley. I, I'm going to be in contact with, with Joe. Whatever we have to do, we're going to do it. But in the meantime, we ought to at least let these crackers know we are not crazy. We ought to at least let these crackers no, we are not crazy, and even if you could only say, keep your hands off Joe Bragg, 
or reinstate the weekend review. Just say that. If, if you, the only thing you can say in your letter is that. Just say that. But let these crackers get a letter from you. You ain't got to worry about your spelling. They know they didn't give you no education. <laughs> you know, Negro was trying to uh, 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 explain to white folk why they can't read. White folk know why you can't read. You are trying to explain to why you can't spell. They already know why you can't spell. Don't worry about that. Just get you a stamp and get it on out there. As our first volley, and I'm going to be meeting uh, with people, and uh, we're going to seriously be addressing this communication issue. Because you can't afford to lose your communications. You cannot afford to do that. And it's no accident that uh, after World War II, Jews made sure they controlled the communications industry. That ain't no accident. That ain't no accident. So that they can tell their story. We're not going to sit here and, and, and take this and, and tolerate it. Uh, and so that, 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 is, that is extremely important for us to deal with that. The other thing I just want to announce, uh, Granddad, who was here, may still be here, left a flyer asking me to announce that on February 3rd, which is Friday, at 12 noon, there will be a demonstration at Korea's First Bank, 29 West 30th Street, between Broadway and Fifth Avenue. The Koreans are imitating the crackers. They've taken your money and they're using it for themselves. That's what you call embezzlement. When they get your money and use it for themselves, they wouldn't have a bank if you wasn't investing in them in the first place. These crackers, these uh, Koreans have come here in less than 10 years and got several banks that you ain't got one. Y'all hear what I'm saying? These Koreans have come here and in less than 10 years, they done built several banks and you don't have one. Every time you get your money from one of them Koreans, you're working against yourself. Every time. You ought to seriously think about every time you got to get them Koreans something. You ought to go out and make it yourself. Instead of buying toothpaste, go out and get some baking soda. We got ways of getting around them. Y'all, they're too modern. Y'all are too modern. Y'all got to go to the bathroom and get some newspaper. That's serious. That's what you call saving the environment. You're recycling your papers. We got ways to get around this. But in the meantime, this is, uh, this is certainly a double treat, one, to, to have a granddaughter around, and then to have someone who I really admired going all the way back to Howard University. And when I arrived at, at Howard, I don't think Brother Kwame was around because he really didn't attend classes. Uh, this brother was usually on the battlefield. He wasn't even nowhere near Washington, D.C. The only thing that uh, uh, he did was to register at the beginning of the semester, 
come back and take his midterm exams and then take his finals and graduated with honors. <laughs> graduated with honors. And the rest of the time, he was down in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and other places fighting white folks. Tennessee and everywhere else fighting white folks. That's how deep uh, this brother was. And when I went to uh, Howard, uh, I remember getting all my little clothes together, my wardrobe, going to Howard University, and getting up there with all the bourgeois Negroes, and they were dressed up in theirs. And then one day, we were out on the campus uh, around the library of uh, uh, Douglas Hall, this black man with these boots and jeans and uh, the green comeback coat came by. They said, everybody said, man, said, that's uh, Stokely Carmichael, man. And everybody said, yeah, man, he weird. Because <laughs> he wasn't knotted up. But other people said, yeah, but that brother's deep, though. That brother's deep. And he was. And it really uh, inspired those of us uh, at Howard because Howard was in great transition then. We were moving the David Dinkins and Andrew Youngs out <laughs> and, and, and bringing in the Alton Maddoxes and Ralph Browns and Stokely Carmichaels. So we had a new revolution of the mind going on at Howard, uh, which was uh, great. But it was really an uh, inspiration of, of uh, this brother uh, that inspired so many of us. And that's why it's good to be around greatness, because it changes people just by being around greatness. And it inspires you. It inspires you. There's no telling what may have happened if Kwame had not been there to a lot of us. And uh, several years later, uh, when uh, the president, a neighbor, said that the only way that we could prove the uh, academic requirements of Howard was to bring in white folks, we took over the administration building, hung him in effigy, and demanded his ouster. Because that nigga had been reading the bell curve. That nigga had been reading the bell curve. He had no confidence in us. And so uh, that may have not happened, though, if this brother had not raised our consciousness. And so I am just always pleased when he comes back to the city. Uh, he's the most humble person, the most humble person, not arrogant, very humble man. And, and that's always a real quality. I remember uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the greatest virtue of all is humbleness, being humble. We got too many arrogant Negroes out here today. Too many high polluted Negroes. But this man has great humility. It's a great sign. He's a servant. Spend his time generously. Because the only thing he's concerned about is educating the masses of black people. And it stayed on course. When many Negroes around him in that movement now, he worked for white folks in some capacity or another. This brother is still on the firing line. And so we uh, are, are very pleased to be here. I hope there are some young people that are out tonight who can get history firsthand from a great warrior who moved us from black protest to black power, Kwame Ture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is your crowd, you see. <laughs> you ain't got to do nothing. <laughs> hey, yes, we are. <laughs> We wish to thank you so much for your very, very warm welcome. 
We would like to make some remarks tonight just about one topic. We'd like to speak tonight about consciousness. All right. You know, we are revolutionaries, and we know as revolutionaries the most important element in revolution is the level of consciousness of the masses of the people. So we want to spend some time, not much, just speaking about consciousness. Adolf Hitler, a fascist, was fond of saying, if you tell a lie a million times, the people will come to think it's the truth. We revolutionaries say, if you tell the truth a couple of times, it will smash a million lies. The indigenous people of this country, commonly called the American Indians, to whom we must be forever grateful. They say that capitalism does not lie some of the time, it lies all of the time. When it tells the truth, it's the result of a double lie. We want to speak about consciousness. And we must make a distinction between human beings and animals of a lower level. Of course, there are many, 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 many distinctions, but we want to highlight only one. Human beings have inside of them, given by God, if one doesn't believe in God by nature, by the makeup of the human body, something that is known as conscience. This conscience is a moral regulator. We say it is innate to every human being. If your preacher has never told you, if your parents have never told you, if your teachers have never told you, once you have done wrong, you know you have done wrong. Because of your conscience. You must not think that this conscience is some immaterial aspect of your life and doesn't have any profound effect upon your life, not at all. In Africa, in traditional societies, when there was question or doubt of some problem in the village, the elder, who had a proper understanding of the body and a proper understanding of the moral regulator, the conscience, would sit those accused in a circle and with a stick he would go around and ask everyone the question. When it came to the one who lied, the stick would tremble. He would say, this is a man who's lying. Today, in the United States of America, in the Soviet Union, in Western countries, if you're arrested, they can subject you to what is known as a lie detector test. They will put some little uh, detectors on your hand, they will ask you questions, and as you answer, it will regulate. Now, they can tell when you lie, unless you've been trained to beat the machine, and you can be trained to beat it. So, that is to say, you can be trained to be a good liar and not <laughs> demonstrate any manifestations of lying. Yeah. The reason why the lie detector can work is because we have inside of our body glands, and one of these glands is the adrenaline gland. And when you lie, even unaware to you, uncontrollable by you, the adrenaline gland pumps more than normal, and it can be detected by the lie detector. So you should not think that lying doesn't affect the body at all. It has a profound effect upon the body. Matter of fact, I think the reason why so many people in America are so stressful is because they lie so much. <laughs> Tell them I'm not home. Don't answer the telephone. Look through the door. I don't want to see him. Matter of fact, not too long ago, I was sitting in a house with somebody, and someone knocked on the door, and one said, Tell him I'm not at home. So, I looked at her, he said, talk to me? He said, yeah. I said, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't lie for anyone. If I must lie, at least it'll be for myself. <laughs> and I don't even lie for myself, so really, I can't lie for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Conscience, then, has a great moral differentiation between human beings and that of the animals. The animals do not know when they do wrong, but when a human being does wrong, his conscience, his conscience informs them that they're doing wrong. If you cheat on a test, your palms will perspire. It is this conscience that we must come to understand properly. 
Now, we want to tell you one thing about conscience. Since we said it is a moral regulator, it can only grow in conditions of the truth. Conscience can only grow in an environment of truth. Therefore, in order to increase consciousness, which comes directly from conscience, one must live the truth. One must live the truth. Now, consciousness is actually normal and instinctive, if you will, to human beings. Here, we come to have great disagreement with capitalism, this backward system, as it advocates its understanding of human nature. Capitalism, in advocating its concept of human nature, will make statements like, power corrupts, and absolute power absolutely corrupts. And make it sound like they've made a heavy statement. They lie again, they lie all the time. Here, the implication is clear. Woman is born basically negative, and once given power, they will negatively use power or abuse power. Anything they get in contact with, since they're born negative, will be negative. This is nonsense. No man, no woman is born negative or positive. Like everything else in life, they are born. They're going to be attracted to negative or to positive activities. All right. Thus, to come and say that you're net, net, once you get power, no. Power doesn't corrupt. I've known a great deal of people who've touched a lot of power and it's not corrupted them. Why, Fidel Castro has never been corrupted by power and will never be corrupted by power. <laughs> All you need to smash the truth is one example and we have a living example. Human beings, we say, of instinctiveness, willingness to move to consciousness, because human beings have an instinctive love of justice. Instinctive. Instinctive. Not to belabor the point, but to prove the point, we will go to the enemies of humanity. Let us go back to Hitler. When Hitler was organizing the Germans into a Nazi army to conquer the world, he didn't come before the Germans and say, hey, let's get together, we're going to rip off the world. If he said that, they would never come together. <laughs> he had to come and lie to them. He had to tell them, listen, we're involved in a just struggle. They've ripped everything off from us. They've taken vengeance against Germany. They've brought us to a little state. They've done all this unjustly. We must now fight for justice to regain what has been taken away. He lied to them and told them they were fighting a just war. But he had to do it because the only way they would come together is through just instincts, just understanding. Look at the Vietnam War some years ago. Ho Chi Minh, a great man whom power never corrupted. Ho Chi Minh told the Vietnamese, we're fighting for democracy, we're fighting for justice. Lyndon Bain Johnson, then President of the United States, told those Americans who were to go there and fight, you're going to fight for justice, you're going to fight against communism, you're going to fight for democracy. Here yeah, you can see clearly the example. One fighting for justice, one fighting for injustice, but all saying they're fighting for justice. So strong is this instinctive love for justice that even the people sometimes have to lie to themselves. When the European settlers came to this country to commit genocide against the indigenous people, not only did they say it was just, but they said it was divinely just. God told them to do it. All right. All right. This understanding of conscience must be properly understood because revolution is a science and we must be precise. Right. <laughs> must be precise. We must make our consciousness grow, but we say it can only grow by living the truth. The job of capitalism, the job of all unjust systems, the job of the enemy is to not only stop our consciousness, but to give us false consciousness. That is to say, to make us think that we're living the truth when in fact we're living a lie. The example of Vietnam is clear. The tragedy of the American capitalist system is that it takes a young man 
confused, who really thinks he's going 10,000 miles away from America to fight for justice, to fight for freedom, to fight for democracy, when in fact he's fighting against himself. Thus, the job of the enemy is to fill us with false consciousness. The job of the enemy is to have us think that America is the best country in the world, the only country in the world, the most just country in the world, and if we have some little bit of problems, be cool. After all, it will soon be worked out. False consciousness. Right. Thus, when you speak of consciousness, when you speak of conscience, you do not speak of reform. You do not speak of changing this person and bringing in this person. You speak of changing the values and ethics of the society. You speak of revolution. This understanding of changing the ethics and the values of the society must be important, especially for us. After all the blood shed in the 60s, after all the reform laws passed on the books of the Congress of the United States of America, and there are many, there's been no change in the relationship of exploitation for the African masses in this country. It's really very simple. Since there's been no change in ethics or values, they just get around the law. It's as simple as that. And keep on doing things just like they used to. The only thing that can change this is the masses of the people consciously organized. This aspect of consciousness must be properly understood. One can be involved in a conscious struggle and be totally unconscious of the struggle in which one is involved. So you must not think that just because you're involved in a movement, you're conscious of the movement. You can be unconscious. Of course. Look, I'm a revolutionary. Revolutionaries have but one objective, the seizure of power. Revolutionaries have but one objective, the seizure of power. If you would look with me at Los Angeles in 1992 at the rebellion of our brothers and sisters there, you would see that these brothers and sisters, though involved in revolutionary struggle, were unconscious. They were not even thinking of seizing mayoral power in Los Angeles. And were they consciously organized, they certainly could have done that. Thus, consciousness doesn't mean participation. As a matter of fact, it could not mean that. When we speak of power, one must be careful here. The capitalist system would have you believe that power is execution. That if you are mayor, you have power. Power begins on the level of conception. Power begins on the level of conception. In the old days, if you lived through the period, you yourself can see it. When you used to call yourself a Negro, and when you started calling yourself a black, there was a big difference. All right. All right. There was a big difference. And between black and African, there's even a bigger difference. Right. This aspect of concept and power starting here must be properly understood. If you tell a people all their life, you ain't nothing, you can't do nothing, you don't do nothing, you can't do nothing, you ain't never did nothing, your people ain't never did nothing, why, chances are that they will try to do nothing. If you tell, uh, the other day I saw a student, he said, you know, Baru Kwame, I have to take some physics. I said, go on in there and take care of business. Well, you know, uh, well, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, because uh, you know our people can, uh, you know. <laughs> That's what I said. Your people gave physics to the world. All right. <laughs> All right. If you don't know your people gave physics to the world, you might think you cannot do physics. But if you know that your people gave physics to the world, you go in the classroom and teach the class. Power begins on the level of conception. That is why consciousness becomes so crucial. Now, we've said now consciousness is based on nothing but the truth, and you must live it. In New York City, there are many, 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 many millions of Africans. If we were to go on meetings like this all over New York City, those who will become are like you. Now, there's a difference between those who came here and those who did not come here. The difference is 
consciousness. The difference is consciousness. Now consciousness, like any other scientific process, can be reversed, but it also can reach a point where it's irreversible. Consciousness, like any scientific process, is reversible, but like all scientific processes, it can reach a position where it is irreversible. When you start as a young child learning mathematics, when you cannot understand how 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 can be anything. But once you learn that 2 plus 2 is 4, and you understand the method of how to arrive at 4 by putting 2 and 2 together, you will never dream that 2 plus 2 is 5. We must struggle to bring the masses of our people to a level of consciousness that is irreversible. Among you here, there are many who have been in the struggle for 20, 30, I see some 40, even 50 years. Those of you who have been in the struggle for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know there are many who started with you that have dropped by the wayside. I mean many. I mean many. I mean not betrayed, just dropped. Of course, that's deserted. And we do say in passing that in any army, whether it be a capitalist army or a socialist army, deserters must be shot. <laughs> deserters must be shot for several reasons. They endanger the life of the others. So people must not think that we have any vengeance against the deserters. No, not at all. We have an army. We must go to fight. There are 35 of us in a battalion. We have to face an enemy of 50 people. We've worked out plans when the 35 come. We come to battle, and instead of 35, there's only 30. Five has deserted. Why, the 30s' lives are in serious jeopardy. All right. Therefore, those five who deserted have not deserted to save their souls, their skins, but they've deserted to put the 30 into problem to lose their skins. This question of deserting is important, especially within our struggle. The armies which I speak of, capitalist army or socialist army, one may be drafted into the army. But this army, which brought you into this slave theater tonight, nobody drafted you. You decided on your own consciousness that you have a responsibility to be here. All right. All right. Nobody drafted you. Therefore, if you desert this army, it's worse than deserting the army into which you were drafted. The reason why they drop by the wayside is because of low level of consciousness. The reason why they drop by the wayside is because of low level of consciousness. We do not mean to imply here that those who have been in the struggle 20, 30, 40, 50 years will not reverse and drop out, no. But those who have reached irreversibility in their consciousness will never drop out from the movement. Now, we said those of you who are in here this evening have a higher level of consciousness than those who did not come. You must not, in any way, think yourself special. Never. Never. At best, at very best, lucky. At very best. It simply means that in your life, at certain times, you happen to be at certain places where certain information was given which came at a right time to affect your life. And you're able to see the truth clearly and quickly and grasp it. That's all it means. Do not think that you were born special. No one is born with consciousness in them. It is a result of struggle. It is a result of uncompromising struggle. Now this aspect of compromise must be properly understood. Consciousness, we say, speak of the truth. The truth is a principle. It is an eternal principle. As revolutionaries, you know, we quote you all the time, we are in Kumis to Reyes, and Osajifo Kwame in Kuma reminds us, one can never compromise principle. You can compromise strategy. You can compromise tactic. But once you compromise principle, you have abandoned it.
There can be no compromise of principle because where principle is concerned, there's no gray area. The press is fond of saying, well, don't go listen to Kwame Ture. He's crazy. He was crazy in the 60s. He's crazy now in the 90s. <laughs> no problem. Malcolm X said, extreme conditions must have extreme solutions. And the conditions are extreme. We are revolutionaries. We follow principles. And we know where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. There is no gray area. Everything is either hot or cold, never warm. Everything is either black or white, never gray. This is clear. We gave the example last year. We repeat it again. And we will continue to repeat it because the point must be properly made. In principle, between truth and lie, there is no common ground. Either you lie or you tell the truth. It's as simple as that. The American capitalist system, made to corrupt the conscience, will make it appear as if you can tell a little white lie and somehow not lie. It's a lie. White lie, black lie, any lie is a lie. And when you lie, you have not told the truth. Where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. Either you believe in God or you do not. A woman the other day trying to find some middle ground, confused by capitalist philosophy. She said, Brother Kwame, I heard you talk about this problem of believing in God or not believing in God. Well, I want to tell you something. I said, yes, my sister. She said, I want to tell you that I, I believe in God, but I have my doubts. I told her. <laughs> Once you start doubting God, you have stopped believing in God. Where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. Therefore, there can be no compromise. Either you hold on to the principle till you die, or you abandon it and change courses in your life. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. We have then shown some aspects of consciousness. We have shown how it comes to grow, how it can be misdirected, etc., etc. We've shown that you have a certain level of consciousness above those who are not here. Now, of course, consciousness, because it is truth, has a responsibility. If you know that 2 plus 2 is 4, and your mother thinks that 2 plus 2 is 5, you will never let your mother think that. You will sit down with your mother and explain to her, look, Ma, this is how you get 2 plus 2, 4. It can't be 5. You see, 1, 2, put 1, 2, 4. You see, that's 4. You put 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, that's 5. So 2 plus 2 is 4. You will never let your mother go around living a lie. Thus, when you have the truth, you have a responsibility to confront lies all the time under all conditions. It is said in Africa that she who knows more must do more. It is said in Africa that she who knows more must do more. Since you have more conscience than the others, you must do more than the others. Since you have more consciousness than the others, you must do more than the others. You must be careful here, because again, capitalist system will come to confuse you. It takes this aspect of individualism to such ludicrous heights of Superman and Rambo, such stupidity. So that those who are sometimes conscious, though thinking they're conscious, get caught up in this capitalist philosophy. I say, listen now, the capitalist system, you got to fight it every second of the day. Because every second of the day, it's trying to lie to you through television, through books, through propaganda, through every possible way. Therefore, it has to be fought every second of the day. Every second of the day. I am certain. Brother Chairman, that among the members of the slave, you can find a group who's willing to give their life at any given moment to advance the cause. I'm certain of it. I'm certain that here within the room, you can find a handful, at least, who are willing at any time to take on any action which they think will advance the people's cause. But they must be warned. Revolution or advancement of the people's cause is never made by one or by a few, only by the masses. Only by the masses. Me, I want my people to be free more than I want anything else in the world. If I could have freed my people by myself, I would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> and we wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> but we can only be freed by the conscious organization of the masses of our people. Only this and this alone that will free us. 
That's your responsibility is not to take your consciousness and show off with it. Last night I went to the slave. You know where our brother got now. Where were you? You should have been there. I ain't going to tell you what happened. Your consciousness is not to be taken around and made some badge of honor. Oh. He who is most conscious is most humble. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Your consciousness is not to be used as a superior weapon over the others. Well, you don't know who the Honorable Marcus Garvey is? Mm -hmm. You don't know that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, okay, come see me tomorrow and have time I'll tell you about him. In no way must your consciousness come to distinguish you from the others except in one. Your constant understanding that you have a responsibility to make them start off the process of being conscious. Right. Not to teach them to be conscious. African tradition says if a man is hungry, you give him a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So it is with consciousness. You don't come to teach somebody to be conscious, and you come to teach them to, like yourselves, seek consciousness. You can only understand consciousness when you understand the true equality of all human beings. And come to understand that the only reason you are conscious is in fact by chance, by best luck. That another man, another woman in the same position where you were at the same given time would be just as conscious as you are. And you, in another place, in another time where there was no consciousness, would be just as unconscious as anybody else. This point must be properly understood. If it's not grasped, you will miss the essence of your responsibility to the masses of your people. Your job, we say, is to make those who did not come into this room, come into the room. Not by you pushing them and forcing them, but just like you with your own internal understanding and level of consciousness coming in, they too coming in. Unless this task is properly understood and scientifically undertaken, we will never make revolution in this country. We will never make revolution anywhere. And all we'll be doing is the same thing we've been doing for centuries. Rise up, make noise, clap, make noise, throw a couple bottles, sit down, and continue to be oppressed. Consciousness. Consciousness calls for the truth. Thus it is clear, since the enemy everywhere lies about us, lies about our history, lies about everything about us, we must, in the first aspect of consciousness, come to give the truth to our people about us. Here, history plays the crucial role. The Honorable Marcus Garvey was fond of saying, a people without history is like a tree without roots. Malcolm X said, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. For us, then, this question of our history is crucial. But I must tell you something about consciousness. If up till now, by luck, you've happened to have it, and you yourself have not systematically sat down and shown how to raise your consciousness, doesn't mean your consciousness will rise. You can stay at a slow level and rise and others will pass you. That's how you can drop out like those who dropped out in the movement before. We say you don't, boy, you're not born consciousness and you don't get it just like that, like that, like that, except by chance. But after a certain time, you have to take consciousness in your hands yourself and make yourself more conscious. So that consciousness while having an exterior force to expel you, also has an interior force. It's like discipline. There are two forms of discipline. Discipline from the outside or discipline from the inside. My father can discipline me to study. 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 You're not going out to your study. Or I can discipline myself to study. Of course, everyone knows the best discipline is the internal discipline, self-discipline. Therefore, the best consciousness is self-consciousness. To seek to be conscious, then, means that one must seek to know the truth. The entire truth. All the truth. If you are truly self-conscious, you want to learn everything there is to learn about your people's history. I mean everything.
Here comes the clear dialectics of life in relationship to consciousness and acquiring knowledge. I know that as long as I live, I will never know all the history there is to know about my people. But being a conscious African, as long as I live, I will never stop trying to know everything there is to know about my people's history. Thus, consciousness does not just seek only to acquire the limit. No, there's no limit here. Who could know what you can learn and what you can understand? Which of you sitting here who have been serious in the struggle, following the struggle, can compare the knowledge you've acquired in the struggle to when you first entered? There's no way the human mind can, uh, can accomplish infinite amount of analyses with proper information given to it. As we said now, in consciousness, information is crucial, and the information must be the truth. We must not lie to ourselves. We must never do that. When you lie to yourselves, you do the job of the enemy for yourselves. The enemy already lies to us. Why should we lie to us? No, we must tell the truth to ourselves, no matter how bitter the truth is. Information is one, but consciousness also calls for clear analysis. Analyses is not difficult at all. To have clear analyses is very simple. You must know where you want to go and how you're going to get there. That's all. You must know where you want to go and how you're going to get there. Once you know where you want to go and how you're going to get there, you must know the obstacles in your path. You must know the obstacles in your path. Huey Newton was shot on a street corner some years ago. I tell you, as Africa is our mother, the police killed Huey Newton. The police killed Huey Newton. The police killed Huey Newton. Without any discussion at all. If you certainly know the objectives and the path and the obstacles, there'd be no question here. In the first place, the police controls all the drugs and all the drug addicts in our communities. The police control them. If you had serious police in America, uncorruptible police in America, you would have no drugs in our community. That's a fact. The police killed Huey Newton. I don't have any more information than anybody else had, but I bet anybody on my life that the police killed Huey Newton and I have no proof. I have no proof. Just like I had no proof that the FBI was infiltrating everywhere, but I knew they were doing it. The proof comes later. Later, you two will say, oh, the brother was right. The police did kill him. The pigs killed him. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. So consciousness, this is just information. It's analysis and clear analysis. Even if the police did not kill Huey Newton, I'd be stupid to think they did not kill Huey Newton. Because consciousness tells you that the enemy doesn't try to just stop it, he tries to destroy it because he must destroy it to stop others from taking the same path. All right. It's logical. Thus, once you're a conscious African, just by being conscious, you are a threat to the system. All right. All right. Once you're a conscious African, just by being conscious, you are a threat to the system. Therefore, Conscious Africans don't try to go out there by themselves. They go out with other conscious Africans. Thus right. right. then the first law of consciousness is to seek others who are on the same level of consciousness or about the same level of consciousness, collect yourself together, and from your level of consciousness, map out your program to advance the people's struggle. Consciousness is never individual. It is always collective. The task before you is a difficult task. But we as revolutionaries tell everyone, we don't want anything except the difficult. All right. As a revolutionary, when I a task are presenting the party, if it's a simple task, I said, no, get at somebody new. Let them struggle with that. Let's see the real difficult ones. Uh, we know that the more difficult the problem, the stronger the warrior. And we need strong warriors for the people. In the Caribbean, the Africans there in their sing-song English say, the rougher the water, the stronger the swimmer. 
<laughs> in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, they say, if you see me fighting with a bear, help the bear pour honey on me. <laughs> it's your people's tradition. It's your people's tradition. You must know your people's culture. Africans don't look for nothing easy, Jack. Matter of fact, just between you and I, we only work when the pressure is hot. <laughs> I mean, it's only when they really put hot pressure we get up, otherwise we just sleep through the low flames. <laughs> so, a conscious person doesn't run away from difficulties, a conscious person runs to difficulties. We say that you have a responsibility as a conscious African in New York City. If you're not careful, you might think the consciousness is yours and you should keep it. Just like some stupid person who's acquired some knowledge think that it belongs to them. Knowledge belongs to the people. Consciousness must be spread rapidly among the masses of our people so we can quickly come together in a conscious manner. All right. This is your responsibility. Of course, we want consciousness to rise, and it does rise. Do not think for one minute that the consciousness of your people is not rising. That's why some people are always, oh, you know, things are just so bad. I just don't know. I just have no hope. I, what do you say? Brother Kwame, how do you make it? Don't you ever get frustrated? Not me. <laughs> In all the bad things you see, never. <laughs> me, I'm a good friend of the uh, Muhammad Ali. I remember when Muhammad Ali was to fight in Zaire against Foreman. I saw him, he said, I want you to come to my fight in Zaire. I said, right, me, I'm a revolutionary. Where am I going to get money from? He said, I'll send you a ticket. I said, send me a ticket, I'll come. He sent me a ticket. I went. <laughs> <laughs> when I got there, you know, many people were afraid that Muhammad Ali might not win the fight. You know, mm -hmm. one time I sit in the corner, I said, wow, you're in trouble. I said, a lot of people out here think he won't win the fight. He said, I'm not paying attention to them at all, brother. He said, I never get into a ring thinking I'm going to lose a fight. Right. If I get into a ring thinking I'm going to lose a fight, I've already lost the fight. Right. <laughs> this fight, I ain't even thinking about this one. This one's so powerful, you kill me tonight, I'm still going to win. <laughs> so the first thing that consciousness must tell you is that the struggle in which you're involved in will lead to inevitable victory. And you must know it and believe it and prove it. He said, consciousness has to do with where you're going. Once you know you're going to victory, can't nothing stop you. Can't nothing slow you down. Can't nothing discourage you. As a matter of fact, when you get discouraged and you become frustrated, you help the enemy. You do nothing for the people. The only way to fight frustration is by clear consciousness that says, this consciousness where I speak to you is based on history. I'm not just talking this because I'm in a revolution. I want no, it's the truth. Look anywhere at all the people in all the struggles in the world. You will see people are oppressed for centuries. They rise up and overthrow them. Everywhere. Even in America here, we were slaves for 400 years. Rose up, overthrew them, smashed it. Finished shadow slavery. Even if they kept us here for 800 years, sooner or later we will rise up and overthrow them. This is a fact of natural history. We say everything changes all the time. It's a fact. You stay on top of me for 500 years, something got to change sometime. Another 500 years, it will change. It will change. Since you know things will change, here's where consciousness plays the crucial role. The job of consciousness is to speed up change. The job of consciousness is to speed up change. That's why consciousness plays such a role in revolution, because all revolution does is speed up change, quick, fast, in a hurry. Consciousness, then, is crucial for your struggle. We are about to conclude, but the point we will hammer in is your responsibility to help make others conscious to help put them on the road of consciousness so they will see the necessity of them themselves gaining consciousness and making contribution to your consciousness. Right. A young brother who just joined our party that I met there was saying, oh, Brother Kwame, you know, you've done so much, you have so much to do. I said, well, because of what I've done, you must surpass what I've done. Right. Of course. <laughs> We're not stupid here. 
If you just stay at the level where I stay, we've never made no progress. You must have passed what we have done because of the work that we have done. Therefore, in consciousness, you don't seek like a teacher to teach somebody to be conscious. You kick them off, and sometimes they can kick off and pass you and help you catch up. Our responsibility is to make our people conscious. We say, do not get this Freudian as if we're not. We're making movement in consciousness. Not too long ago, a white reporter said, oh, you know, Kwame Ture, you might as well tell the truth. He said, what's that? You always talk about your people, your people. I said, that's right, I don't depend on nobody but my people. He said, but you know, if it wasn't for the press, you'd never get the word black because it was the press that gave the word black. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, and who gave the word African? Hiding drugs in the 60s? I was relaxed. We're doing it. That's right, we're doing it. I'm not sentimental. I cannot be. I'm a revolutionary. And secretary reminds us all, in revolution, there is no sentiment. I know, just as a conscious human being, that no one is sitting in this room can give me any example since the beginning of time where any group of any people fighting for any social progress have made any advancement without the shedding of blood. Nowhere. Right. Right. Nowhere. Right. No Take your nonviolent movements like Martin Luther King. There must be shedding of blood, even if it's King. There's nowhere where we make human advancement without the shedding of blood. So if Africans are dying, I don't get upset. They're supposed to die. We try and advance. You can't advance without dying. That's clear. The only question is, how can this dying be made purposeful in our struggle to advance? That's the only question above us. This is a revolutionary. I don't get upset. Oh, Brother Kwame, you know in the Harlem Hospital now, infant mortality rate is high. That's one battlefront. So we lose X number of babies per year on this battlefront. Oh, Brother Kwame, you should go to the schools. They're just terrible. Do -do -do -do. That's another battlefront. So we lose 40% of the minds there. That's a battlefront. Oh, Brother Kwame, you should see the drugs. It's just terrible. We lose so many. That's another battlefront, the drug battlefront. We lose X number there, too. Oh, you should see the gang warfare. Do -do -do. That's another battlefront. We lose some there, too. And then you know the police just killed so many of us. That's another battlefront. And we lose so many there too. If you say you're at war with the enemy and you're conscious, then you know what war is. And when the enemy knocks you down, you don't cry like a baby. It only makes you frustrated. You count bodies just like any general. How many did we lose in this war? One, two, three, four. How can we improve it so we lose less until we get victory? How many did we lose on this front? X number. What conditions can we do to improve it so that we don't lose this many until we arrive at victory? It's scientific revolution. It's precise. There's no, rev there's no sentiment here. We lose X number on this front, X number of that front, X number on every front. But conscious people come to direct their energies to help speed up the process where we lose less and convert more towards the struggle. We say our consciousness is rising everywhere. The enemy has no new tricks. He has old tricks. He has no new tricks. And the people's consciousness is rising. I am sure that the white boy who sat down and wrote the script for Malcolm's daughter and Farrakhan, he thought he had, ev and Farrakhan, he thought he had everything ready. I mean, that's All a perfect right. script. Right. I mean, we were supposed to go off. But you know what? Nobody, I mean nobody, I mean nobody went for that okey doke today. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Nobody went for it. Old people didn't go for it. Uncle Tom's didn't go for it. Nobody went for it. Nobody went for it. Yes. Our consciousness is rising everywhere. And you must come to see it properly. When they fired Ben Chavis, they could say whatever they want. Everybody knew the Zionist pigs were the one who had him fired. Everybody knew it. You must watch the people's consciousness. That's what causes revolution. Yeah, on one level, the old tricks of dividing on that's finished. They've got to find something else. That one's gone, completely gone. And we must reinforce the consciousness. And the way to reinforce the consciousness, tell the people, all the divisions we have come from the outside. Hear me well. Hear me well. All the divisions we have come from the outside. Hear me well. Even if we make the division ourselves inside, be sure the enemy is going to exacerbate it on the outside.
If the contradiction among us is not antagonistic, be sure the enemy is going to make it antagonistic. The people have come to see that clearly now. The people have come to see clearly now from the actions of Ben Chavis that we must control our organizations and we would stand up and, say, and we will not allow any people from the outside to dictate to us. This is advance in the people's consciousness. This advancement is crucial. Our job is to help push this consciousness. What do we mean then by your responsibility? There are many ways of spreading a message. One can write, one can put it on television, one can put it on the radio, one can use the voice. Some people think that when they live in a multimedia society, that somehow the voice and personal contact is nothing against them. You make a big mistake here. You underestimate yourself and you do nothing for your people's struggle. You come into contact daily with hundreds of people, literally. You know hundreds of people who need to be made conscious, but when you come to make them conscious, you must be very careful. You must be very careful. Right. Zary D. Campbell. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I won't be here long. I know why you, we're all here. And to all of my Malcolm X College family, that's each one of you. When you step foot in this college, you are part of the Malcolm X College family. To my talented and inspiring platform companions, to the beautiful Najwa and the Najwa dancers. And by the way, let's give the drummers some, okay? Yeah. <laughs> to all of you, welcome to Malcolm X College where empowerment through education is more than a classroom experience. As you can see here tonight, for us, it is a cultural and spiritual odyssey every day. What a fitting way for Malcolm X College to conclude the formal celebration, the formal recognition of black or African American, or as Kwame Ture is going to tell us tonight, African History Month. For at Malcolm X College, our heritage and our pride is celebrated every day. It has been said, either you are revolutionary or you're not. And if you're not, you might as well be an artist. If you can't be an artist, you might as well be a revolutionary. It's very little middle ground. Earlier in the program, you saw and heard the artists. Now it is time to hear from one of the original revolutionaries. Our speaker, our honored guest, is truly a revolutionary. He has been in the vanguard of social change in this country and internationally. A participant in the first freedom rides and sit-ins and marches, he illustrated the power that students can have in shaping their own destinies and as an example of that here at Malcolm X College, the student government at Malcolm X College is responsible for this program. And I want to give Judy Johnson her due. <laughs> as an organizer, he empowered urban and rural African, African Americans, helping them to recognize that within them the seeds of freedom lay dormant, and it was time for them to be released. Black power. He embodied it. He recognized it in his brothers and sisters and forced all of us to recognize it as well, no matter how uncomfortable it may have been at that time. Many of you know his story by rote, organizer of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in Alabama's Lowndes, Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and as program director and chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He's a student of President Touré of, of Guinea and former president of Ghana, Nkrumah. He's an organizer of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. He has traveled throughout Africa, Europe, Asia, including Vietnam, where he had an audience with Ho Chi Minh. In the Middle East, 
He visited refugee and guerrilla camps. He addressed the first conference of Latin American Solidarity in Havana. He has lectured at Howard, Yale, Stanford, Notre Dame, University of Chicago, Florida, and finally, Malcolm X College. Yes, Malcolm X College. He has also spoken at universities of the Sudan, Tanzania, Egypt, Guinea, Uganda, and many, many more. A dynamic lecturer, political activist, author, and organizer, tonight he speaks to us on the identity question. Black and powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise to welcome Kwame Ture. Thank you. That was such a beautiful introduction. Thank you. We wish to thank you ever so much. And uh, you know, I must tell you, uh, our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, does a lot of work uh, among students. And uh, it is very rare that uh, presidents of the universities even come when I'm there. They usually say, how did he get in here? Get him out as quickly as possible. <laughs> so I must tell you, it's a great honor to have been introduced by uh, President Campbell. I also wish to tell you that since my stay here this morning with the uh, Learning Center, your president, your assistant dean, Brother Letcher, and all of your administrators, your faculties, and your students have been most hospitable to us. And certainly I wish to thank them and to thank them for you because they properly represented you. I've been with you all day. and. Uh, the time has just flown away, and we're so sorry it's uh, going so quickly, but it's only because your, hospitable ha your, hospitability, your hospitability has been so warm that the time has gone so quickly. I would like to impose just one thing upon you. You know, one of the tasks of, uh, well, anyway, in my case of revolution is that you have to leave the side of your mother to wage struggle. And, uh, Yes, of course, nobody wants to leave the side of their mother, and the only reason I leave the side of my mother is for revolution. And uh, I don't get a chance to see my mother much, but I have a lot of mothers, because uh, in my family I'm the only son, and so if there are problems which a son needs, I have so many brothers who are around that any time my mother is in trouble, before she calls for trouble, they will go and help her. So uh, she has a lot of sons around her, and wherever I go, I have a lot of mothers. And tonight I have a very favorite mother of mine who's in the audience, and... Uh, this mother has produced some real warriors, and uh, one of her sons, my ideological brother, uh, was in jail, just got out of jail not too long ago, and he's a fighter too, and he's still fighting, and she came out tonight in the cold, so I felt so honored. I just want you to say hello to just the mother of another struggler. Where's Mrs. Brown? Thank you, sir. And so we wish to speak on the question of identity, which is the question that you asked us to make some remarks about. Of course, were we not an oppressed people, there would be no need to discuss this question. Because it is only an oppressed people who are confused on what their interests are, consequently on who they are, what their identity is. This is clear because the job of an oppressor once the oppressor people, is to have the people believe that the history of the oppressor and the history of the oppressed is one and the same. The job of the oppressor is to have the people believe that the culture of the oppressor and the culture of the oppressed is one and the same. The job of the oppressor is to have the oppressed believe that the interest of the oppressor and the interest of the oppressed are one and the same. It is the job of the oppressor to have the oppressed believe that the destiny of the oppressor and the destiny of the oppressed is one and the same. Indeed, what the oppressor seeks to do is to have the oppressed identify totally with the aspirations and the interest of the oppressor. Once this is done, the oppressed is finished. Consequently, it is clear... Oh, it's finished. There's no question about it. It is clear that 
Since the oppressed will always fight, there will always be contradictions between the history of the oppressed and the oppressor, the culture of the oppressed and the oppressor, the interests of the oppressed and the oppressor, etc. Of course, Malcolm X said it best. Malcolm said, whatever the oppressor is for, the oppressed must be against. Whatever the oppressor is against, the oppressed must be for. So Malcolm X is absolutely correct. Any slave who is so confused that he thinks that the interest of the master is the same as the interest of the slave, that when things go good for the master, it goes good for the slave, this is a stupid slave. He will pick cotton at night. <laughs> but an intelligent slave, he'll try to burn the plantation down. Thus, from the very beginning, we must understand that the job of the oppressor is to understand that they must take diametrically opposed positions to the oppressor in every arena. Of course, this problem of history and controlling the history is crucial for an oppressed people. In America, the oppressor, the capitalist system, has done such a good job that some Africans actually think that we came to America on the Mayflower. They seek to see no differences between us and the oppressor at all. As a matter of fact, they do not even look for the history. The job of the oppressor is to make us think that our well, history began when they came in contact with us. Indeed, this is the concept that they have for all life. They will tell us that Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. And they will tell us nothing of America before 1492. And all those who do not look to America before 1492 cannot respect the indigenous people and will not know that this land belongs only to them. We say this aspect of clarifying one's history is crucial, especially for an oppressed people. The Honorable Marcus Garvey was fond of saying that a people without history is like a tree without roots. It will cling to anything and call it home, even a plantation. Thus, this aspect of understanding our history is crucial. We want to take just a little bit time of it. We have to spend some time with this question of history as we move to the question of identity. Because we cannot have identity of purpose with the enemy. As a matter of fact, we can have identity with the enemy on no issue at all. All issues must take the opposing stand. This has always been my practice. Uh, a few years ago when George Bush talked about invading uh, Baghdad, I sent a message quickly to Saddam Hussein. I said, I'm with you. The man said, why, this is not possible. I said, yes, it is. I said, if I'm the imam of Mecca and American imperialism is fighting with the devil, I'm on the side of the devil. Because I know American imperialism is wrong from the jump. So it is in coming to understand our history. In the first place, the American capitalist system makes us think that history is something made by one great man, and this great man is usually one great man outside of our race, usually a great white man. So thus, even in the making of our history, they come to so confuse us that we actually think that we never advance without some great white man being for us. Do you know, even to this day, some Africans are still talking stupidity, asking me, what you think about Clinton? <laughs> Obviously, these people have no understanding of life. I think nothing of him. Clinton has never done anything for me. Everything that's ever been done for me, especially in the field of advancing my struggle, has been done by the masses of my people. They and they alone. <laughs> Thus here there is no confusion. We give just some slight examples so you can see we're not speaking rhetoric and so you yourself will begin to grasp properly this question of the movement of history. History in the first place is never made by any one person. We know that. It's made only by the masses of the people. But for us, we say it's even worse. It's made just for one people, one person. They will tell us in the history book that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. 
And if one is not intelligent, one will accept this history as our history and say, Abraham Lincoln freed us. Thank you, Abraham. But if one would just take a statistical, a statistical look at the Civil War, one will see this is not the truth. We're not asking for analyses here. We're just speaking statistics. In 1859, John Brown was lynched in this country by Lee. Lee at that time was working for the federal government. He lynched John Brown in, 19, in 1859. History, you must know, cannot be stopped. History, once it marches forward, no force on earth can stop it. They hung John Brown in 1859 for starting armed struggle to liberate the slaves. And in 1861, the same Lee who had hung John Brown as a federal army officer was the first to lead the attack against the federal to start the Civil War. Two years, the same man who hung John Brown was the same man who was the first general to give the order to start the Civil War. The Civil War started in 1861. We are told that Abraham Lincoln started the war to free us. It's the South that started the war in the first instance. The war started in 1861, and we are told that Abraham Lincoln started the war to free the slaves. Yet, Oh, Frederick Douglass wore his shoes out going to Abraham Lincoln when the war began, begging him to free the slaves. Lincoln's generals themselves wrote long letters to him. They explained to him, the slaves are a mass labor force for the South. All the South soldiers do is sit and fight. The slaves dig the ditches. The slaves cook the food. The slaves clean their, their weapons. The slaves take care of their uniforms. The slaves take care of them when they're ill. We must free the slaves to get this source of labor away from the white South because all the white South has to do is fight. And fight they did. Lincoln refused to free the slaves. And Douglas was walking every day telling him his army generals were sending him paper for them. It was not a question of liberal rights or anything. It was simply a war strategy. Take this, arm, take this force away from them. It was not until 1863 when the South was winning the war and the North was losing the war and Lincoln saw that the North was losing the war that he signed the Emancipation Proclamation to let the slaves be free. Two years into the war which he started to free us. When Lincoln freed the slaves in 1863, Frederick Douglass wore out his feet, going to tell him, let the slaves pick up the gun. Lincoln refused to let the slaves pick up the guns. His northern generals were writing him and telling him, the war is going down. These slaves can fight just like anybody else. We need manpower. Let the slaves pick up the guns. Lincoln refused to do so. It was not until 1864 that Lincoln finally signed the law allowing the slaves to pick up the guns. And when the slaves picked up the guns, the war was over in nine months. You must properly know your history. And you must know the only people who make your history is the masses of your people, them and them alone. When you know this, you will thank no one else for your advancement except the masses of your people. And when you do this, everything you get, you will give back to the masses of your people. In the 1960s, a journalist once came to me, got me rather annoyed. He said, what do you think about President Johnson? I said, hey, just like any other hunky, I guess. He, he said, no, you must respect Johnson. I said, why? He said, you know, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill. I said, he did. He said, so you must thank him for it. I said, of course he signed it. But while Johnson was signing the Civil Rights Bill, my people were burning this city down to the, this country down to the ground. He better hurry up and sign something. Yes. So it is now the talk of Clinton. Clinton? Clinton has done nothing for my people. Everything that my people get, they get in this country off of nothing other than the shedding of their blood. This history, we say, we must come to understand. The reason why we must come to understand our history is that the job of the oppressor is to have the oppressed believe that they can do nothing without the oppressor. And if they cannot make their history by themselves, they certainly will think they're incapable of making their liberation by themselves. Thus, in the very first instance, they must know that they and they alone make their history. And they and they alone are the motive agents for making their history. They can make this history either consciously or unconsciously, but they are the only ones that will make this history. The American capitalist system, intending to keep us in a position of inferiority, 
therefore thinking we're incapable of doing anything without them, makes it appear as if we, the Africans in this country, have no background at all other than America. The only people in this country who belong to America are the indigenous people of this country. Everybody else in this country is an immigrant. I remember when Reagan used to be president, he used to talk about all these people coming in from uh, uh, South America, uh, Mexico and South America, all these aliens, we've got to stop them. I used to laugh, you're the biggest alien in the country. <laughs> but some Africans get confused. Because the capitalist system has cut off our history, they think that we have no history. They really think that our history began in slavery. If you will look at all textbooks in this country, even on the college level, history textbooks, there's nothing said about Africa in these textbooks at all. I mean, Africa is just left out. Like it doesn't exist at all, just like our history. Thus, most Africans who do not take time as a conscious people to come to understand their history, in fact, begin their history when the white man came and discovered us as slaves. Certainly, the indigenous people of this country think that their history began with Columbus, they would be in serious trouble. They, who properly know their history, know that the indigenous people of this country raised civilizations, the heights of which European powers have not yet arrived at. Consequently, these people have this to hold on to, and they know as long as they hold on to it and fight, they will come back to the grandeur that was once theirs. No people can begin their history in slavery. No people. God has never created anybody in slavery. All people are first created free, then they are enslaved. So thus any African beginning their history in the United States of America is a stupid African beginning their history in slavery. And if you begin your history in slavery, the best you can hope to be is a good slave. Indeed, if you begin your origins in slavery, where is the inspiration to fight? A people who were enslaved must know at one time they were free. It is only when they know at one time they were free that they will be motivated by the responsibility which history imposes upon them to struggle to be free again. Any African wanting to know about their history and using their history as a weapon to fight must begin their history in Africa. There's no other place. It was only in Africa that we were free. Thus it is in Africa that we must begin our history. Once we see in Africa how we were free, then we will come to see who imposed slavery upon us. We will come to know directly who is the enemy, what must be done to return to a stage of freedom again. Thus in the struggle for liberation, Africa is indispensable to us as our historical weapon. We say and we repeat that the job of the enemy is to confuse us. You will find everybody in this country, Europeans who left their country voluntarily, turned their backs on Germany, turned their backs on the Soviet Union voluntarily to come to America when they arrive here. They don't forget the countries they voluntarily left, and they left it voluntarily. No African left Africa voluntarily. Every one of us had to be dragged out of there against a will through a ship of hell that no, no Holocaust has seen, and today we still live in hell in America, after all we've done for America. And yet, some people do not want to look back to Africa where we were free and our culture was moving. No slave can have dignity. A slave can only get dignity in the fight for freedom. The only way a slave arrives at dignity is when they fight for freedom. If you're not fighting for freedom, you're a slave, thus you have no dignity as a human being. We say the only way we will get this inspiration to fight is when we come to properly understand our history, to understand who we are. It is your history that will tell you who you are and what your interests are. It is your history that will tell you where you were going before your, your life was so brutally interrupted and you must decide whether you want to return to it again. Let me give you a simple example of the necessity of history. You've been hearing in the last few years much discussion, even inside the African community, about the breakup of our family. I mean, people are talking about the breakup of our family. But if one doesn't have a proper historical analysis, one will get totally confused. 
In the first place, when we came here as slaves, the family structure was thoroughly broken down. This was the job of the slave master. He had to break down the family structure because the family structure at least represented a biological unit which could rebel. Everyone knows the history. Daughters were sold from mothers, sons were sold from mothers, everyone was scattered throughout, no one had a family. When the Emancipation Proclamation came, Africans came to imitate the family structure of their master. This family structure is a nuclear family. Africans do not even know how this family structure arose. Certainly this family structure was not part of our history in Africa. This family structure arose out of capitalist Europe as it tried to tie the working men to their families. So as it had not done even come out of our culture. This nuclear family in America itself is breaking down. Since its original reason for coming into being was to force the European male worker to be responsible to his family, thus tie him to the workplace, today people follow jobs, so there's no tying one to the workplace. Consequently, the nuclear family is breaking down for the master. If it is breaking down for the master, it is crystal clear that it must break down for the slaves who imitated the structure of the family of the master. History becomes important. The nuclear family is not the only family structure that exists. There are many others. And the first thing a slave must do is not to imitate the oppressor at all. The Bible has a powerful verse. In Proverbs 3, verse 31, it says, be thou not envious of the oppressor, and follow none of his ways. We said that these Africans just imitate the structure immediately. Some imitate it because they think it's the best. After all, it's the master, you know, so there ain't none better than it's American. What's better than American? Some follow it unconsciously. Others just follow it because others are following it. But certainly, if we were to look properly at the family structure in Africa, we would see that Africa did not even have a nuclear family. Its family structure was the extended family. All those people who are speaking about the breakup of the family, if they've done no history about Africa, seeing an alternative structure to the family structure given to us by the master, keeps following the master down a blind alley. Instead of imitating the master, we should be picking up our history and reconstructing our history consciously. Extended families will solve all the problems that we face. Thus, we give simple example for the necessity of history. It is your history that will solve the problems you face today. And if you have the history of the master, you will not solve the problems because it's the master's history that has created all our problems. This must be properly understood. This separation from the master's history is crucial. There is no other place that we can better separate from the master's history than in Africa. Here in Africa, there is no question. The greatness of Africa looms before all. As a little button said, because people always think that the Greeks did this, the Greeks did that, I saw a little button once that said, it might sound Greek to you, but I know it's Egyptian. Yes. <laughs> once one knows one history, there's no confusion here. We are fighting against the capitalist system. Its job is to make the people irresponsible to themselves. Its job is to confuse them about their history. Its job is to confuse them totally. The job of the people is to fight against the capitalist system every second of the day on every level. On every level. If one doesn't do this, one will be certainly confused. The interests of Africa and the interests of America are diametrically opposed. We can lightly say America got her wealth from raping Africa's labor and Africa's wealth. And we can continue, America continues being rich from continuing to rape Africa's labor and Africa's wealth. That's why she's in Somalia, to rape Africa's oil once again. <laughs> Thus, this aspect of understanding history is crucial. But the American capitalist system keeps the people ignorant. It must. Because once the people see the slightest truth, the American capitalist system is finished. Examples can be seen everywhere. During the war of Vietnam, America showed only one side of the war. America was fighting for democracy. America was fighting for democracy. America was fighting for democracy. They never showed the other side, that the Vietnamese were fighting for democracy. On the contrary, they kept saying the Vietnamese were terrorists and communists. 
And you know, nobody in America knows what a communist is, but everybody hates them. Yes. That's how the capitalist system, it makes you take a position based on total ignorance. You don't know what, you, what, you, what the position is, you either support it or you're against it. The other day I was talking about socialism. A man told me, I ain't no socialist brother. He said, I'm a capitalist. You know, you better stop talking that socialist stuff. America's a capitalist country, that's why it's so rich. And it's the best country in the world. He talked all this garbage. I asked him a simple question. Brother, you for capitalism? I support the capitalist system. Brother, how much capital you got in the bank? <laughs> he was unemployed. <laughs> you know what Malcolm said, sometimes a slave fight harder than the master to put out the master's house. <laughs> yes. He knows nothing about capitalism. He's for it. He knows nothing about socialism. He's against it. That's when you come to fight against capitalism, you must know that they make people take positions based on ignorance. First they make the people ignorant, and then they make them arrogant in their ignorance. You will look at the preparation of our identity. Africans are ashamed to identify with Africa. Ashamed. Ashamed. And the only reason they're ashamed is because they're ignorant. Totally ignorant. You'll find me any African who tells you I ain't no African, and I will show you an ignorant man, an ignorant woman, in every aspect of world history and world civilization. Hear me well. I did not say African history or African civilization. I said world history and world civilization. Simply because any man, any woman, knowing anything of world history and world civilization will see the overwhelming contributions which Africa have made in these areas that they must be proud and respect Africa. We tell you that any time you find a brother or sister who tells you that I ain't no African, you must know this brother and this sister is an ignorant man or woman. Do not make them hostile with them. Try as best as you can to give them a little knowledge of Africa. Stimulate them to want to just look towards Africa. And once you've got them looking towards Africa, you can look the other way. Because once they see Africa, they will not want anybody to mistake them for anything other than African. The capitalist system does everything possible to hide Africa from us. It's not just by haphazard. They have spent millions and billions of dollars, time and energy, on directing our thinking away from Africa. I mean, you don't think Tarzan just happened, do you? You don't think the swollen bellies get put on television just by accident, do you? They never show you Africans fighting with guns in their hands for freedom in Africa. They have never showed it. They show you starving babies because their job is to keep you alienated from Africa because they know what you don't know. Once you see Africa, once the Africans all over the world sees Africa, it becomes a central point of unification. The capitalist system and the world imperialist system is finished. Because they must do everything to keep us away from Africa. Africa is your home. And if you do not know it's your home, you need to get some knowledge of world history and world civilization. I gave you just one of the contributions which Africa has made to world history and world civilization in the area of religion. We use this area all the time. It's necessary because our people are so confused. The other day when speaking to a young sister, she said, yeah, I'm against all religions. I said, all religion? She said, yeah. I said, why is that? Because they're all masculine. All their gods are he gods. I told her, I'm sorry, you know nothing of your history. You know absolutely nothing of your history. In the first place, one God, the concept of one God, monotheism, was given to the world by Africa. And when Africa gave the concept of one God to the world, it was not a male God, it was a female God. She is known as Ast in the African language, A-A-S-T. In the Greek, she is known as Isis, I-S-I-S. -I -S. The first God given to the world was a she-God given to the world by Africans. African sisters, give yourself a hand. <laughs> yeah, know your history. <laughs> See, you must know your history. You must know your history. When Africa was practicing monotheism, nowhere else in the world was it being practiced. You must not get confused. There are others who will try to steal Africa's history and steal Africa's culture. That's their job. 
But you must know that when Africa was practicing monotheism, to the east of Africa, they were worshiping the sun. To the north of Africa, in Saudi Arabia and in Palestine, they were worshiping idols. And they would do so until the 6th century, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his name, came to bring monotheism in the, in the vehicle of Islam to this area of the world. This must be clear to you. You must understand it properly. Because if you understand this, then the second statement, Africa's next contribution of religions to the world, is clear to you. The religion of Judaism, which is the first religion, chronologically speaking, that preaches monotheism, belief in one God, was given to the world by Africa. The first Jews in the world were Africans. I do not come to give you rhetoric. I do not even send you to Dr. Benjo Cannon for documentation. I send you to Sigmund Freud, a Jew himself, in his last book, Moses and Monotheism, where he, using archaeological, historical, scientific, and even psychological proofs, come to show us that Moses was nothing other than an African. We just have to be clear. This is necessary for us. See, if you don't know your history, you get confused. Africans in this country, some of them are confused. They don't even know what Zionism is. Some even think that when you attack Zionism, you attack Judaism. They don't know what it is. All they know is you're not supposed to attack it. Judaism is a religion. My people gave it to the world. Even if I'm not a Jew, being a conscious African, I have a responsibility to protect the integrity of Judaism. So at all times, under all conditions, I must be opposed to Zionism. Zionism is not a religion. It is a backward, racist, illegal, political philosophy, which is doomed. It's doomed. It, like all unjust systems, tries to call, control religion. You know, if you were not careful, they will have you believe that a slave master was a Christian. Yes. All unjust systems. Could you imagine a slave master being a Christian? Give me a break. But some people even argued, well, yes, you know, it could be, come on. <laughs> a slave master, a slave master being a Christian is like a Zionist being a Jew. A slave master will take Christianity to hunt slaves. A Zionist will take Judaism to shoot Palestinian people down in the street in the name of God. After all, you know the Europeans, when they came here, they killed the Indians with God on their side. All unjust systems cease to take religions, and if you're not careful, you might really think that God is on the side of the Americans. You might really think they trust in God with their sign on the dollar bill and not in the dollar. So you must not get confused. Zionism is a political si system. It is opposed to Judaism. Zionism seeks to steal the land from the Palestinians, just like the European settlers stole the land from the Indians in the name of God. Just like the racist pigs in Azania, South Africa, want to say that they have the right to dominate us over in the name of God. We've heard enough of these people calling God. Judaism is a religion. Anyone can be a Jew, and you must not get confused. They try to make it appear as if only European are Jews. Even with their problems with the Ethiopians, where they had to go and do their Operation Moses, they blew their whole card by showing people, oh, you mean there are Jews who are not? Yes, there are Jews in every race. There are Jews who are Semitic. There are Jews who are Cossacoid. There are Jews who are Africans. This is a fact because it's a universal religion. It doesn't belong to any one people. Anytime one people try to claim the religion, they become racist, and that's what Zionism is. The role of Christianity in Africa is crucial. We take some time with you. Because you know you Christians all say you Christians. <laughs> Don't read your Bible, but you say you're Christians. Uh, you mustn't laugh nervously. <laughs> it is true. It is true. Could you imagine a college student who say they're Christian and have never read the Bible from cover to cover? I say the capitalist system makes them ignorant and makes them arrogant in their ignorance. The other day I met a brother calling himself a Christian. Hello, Christian, Brother Kwame, that's good. Brother, can you read? Yeah, I can read. I'm the best reader in my class. When I was in the fifth grade, I was reading on the right. Excellent. My brother, have you read the Bible from cover to cover? No. I laughed at him. <laughs> he got mad. <laughs> I'm a revolutionary, Jack. <laughs> I know the truth never quivers before lies. On the contrary, truth crushes lies without pity and without mercy. I laugh louder. <laughs> you call yourself a Christian? <laughs> you never read the Bible? <laughs> he said, let me tell you something, Brother Kwame. You don't have to read the Bible to be a Christian. He was correct. I applauded for him. You're absolutely correct. But if you're a Christian 
and you can read and you don't read the Bible, you're a stupid Christian. The truth is the light. The truth is the light. The Chinese say if you make a mistake and you know it's a mistake and you don't correct the mistake, you've made your second mistake. If any of you here call yourself Christians and you can read and write and you have never read your Bible from cover to cover, you've made a great mistake. I hope you correct it. I hope you correct it. It is necessary for you to correct it. Because if Christians knew the history of Christianity, if Christians read the Bible, all of them, irrespective of their color, must respect Africa. Must respect Africa. The only Christian who doesn't respect Africa is a hypocrite because they don't know Christianity. If one would begin just with the life of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, when he was a young man and everybody was looking to kill him, the only place he found safe refuge was in Africa. It was Africa that took him in. It was Africa that protected him. It was Africa that told all, you will not touch him. It was Africa where he grew spiritually, imbuing, taking monotheism, which had been in Africa for centuries. He came to swallow this in Africa. It was Africa that he grew physically. It was Africa that he grew intellectually, preparing him for his later work. How could any Christian not respect Africa? Indeed, if it wasn't for Africa, they'd have killed Jesus Christ a long time. He wouldn't even been here. The first church in the world came out of Africa. The first monastery in the world came out of Africa. The very intellectual development of the church came out of Alexandria, which still is in Egypt, which still is in Africa. Everywhere they try to pull it out. We say if these Christians would read their Bible, there'd be no confusion at all. The very first country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, is Ethiopia. If you look at your Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, this Ethiopia might be spelled Cush, C-U-S-H, or Cush, K-U-S-H. The dictionary will tell you Cush is the ancient name for Ethiopia. That's uh, Genesis 2, verse 13. That means like uh, in Genesis 1, God created the world, and here you are, Ethiopia. That's the Bible. It's the Bible. Your Bible. <laughs> If anyone reads the Bible, they will see that Egypt and Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible more than any other country, starting with Israel. We say that these Christians don't even read their Bible, and they cannot be allowed to read their Bible because if they do, they will stop confusion. I would imagine that a Christian would know the history of Christianity. I would imagine. But capitalist system, we say, will direct the people to frivolity away from the forces that affect their lives. I will go to a college campus, find a sister who's a member of a sorority, find a brother who's a member of a fraternity, both of them are Christians, and they will know more about the history of the frat and the sorority than they do about Christianity. If Christianity is more important than the fraternity, we assume that they would know the history of Christianity. It took 400 years after the death of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, he needs it with these followers, before, of course, <laughs> before Christianity entered into Europe, 400 years after his death. European imperialism, we say, will confuse us everywhere. Its job is to make us inferior, make us think we have no history, make us think we made no contribution to history. Thus, if you will look properly throughout the world, wherever you go in African churches, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in South, Central, and North America, even in Canada, all of them, practically all of them, most of them, the overwhelming majority of them, will have a picture of a white Jesus, replete with blonde hair and blue eyes. Anyone reading the history of Christianity will know this is a lie, because Jesus Christ never stepped his foot in Europe. I mean, he just never saw it. I mean, if you want to discuss the color of Jesus Christ, which is not our task tonight, the statement we make is a correct statement. Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, could be just about any color, but the one color he definitely could not be is the one they always paint him, white. We say it all the time, if these Africans would do the slightest research, they would come to see that this white Jesus is nothing other than the uncle of Michelangelo who painted the picture and used his uncle as a model for the painting. <laughs> History is crucial. Africa's contributions, we said, to world religions are outstanding. 
When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his name, was organizing in Mecca, and the feudal lords of Mecca rose up against him, and he had to retreat. He retreated. In retreated, he gave orders to his disciples, go to Africa, he said, you'll find what you're looking for. The disciples, following his orders, went to Ethiopia. When they arrived at Ethiopia, they explained to the Ethiopians who they were. The feudal lords of Mecca pursued them from Saudi Arabia to Ethiopia. The Ethiopians had relations with these feudal lords, commercial. You know, Ethiopia was the first state in the world. Of course, you know that. <laughs> so when America talks about state, give me a break. They got 200 years. <laughs> give me a break. Ethiopia, well, I 200 years, not even a baby in diapers. Ethiopia was the first state in the world. These feudal lords followed them there, and they told the Ethiopians, give us the, the disciples because they're this or that. The Ethiopians refused even though they had relationships with the feudal lords. Not only did they refuse to turn them over, they granted full freedom to disciples in Ethiopia. They took care of them, and when the prophet had found himself in Medina, the Ethiopians themselves conducted the disciples to rejoin the prophet in Medina, where once having done so, they were now able to spread Islam rapidly throughout the world. If the Ethiopians had not granted asylum to the disciples and they were killed, Islam would never spread throughout the world. We have just given you, in brief passing, four of Africa's great contributions only in one arena, the arena of religion. We didn't touch science. We only talked of religion. Here we showed you Africa produced monotheism, belief in one God. Africa gave Judaism to the world. Africa stabilized Christianity for the world. Africa saved Islam for the world at a time of danger. Tell me, which African? knowing these facts will not be proud to be an African. Any time you find someone who's ashamed of Africa, it's only because they're ignorant. You learn something about Africa and pump them up with their history. Pump them up. We must come to understand this necessity of being African. I don't see what the confusion is. The confusion is only the capitalist system, which makes us ashamed of it without knowing nothing about it. There are cannibals there. As a matter of fact, when this system gets through with it, it makes it feel as if we should be happy for being brought to America, even through a slave ship, as deliverance out of Africa. Could you imagine that? I mean, and some Africans actually believe that. That's why they don't even want to look back to Africa. Look back to Africa for what? Do they have Coca-Cola and color TV over there? <laughs> The other day I was talking to a brother, I told him he was African, he told me, no, he wasn't African. I told him, yes, he was, no, he said, I wasn't born in Africa. I said, what? He said, I was born in America. He didn't read Malcolm. Malcolm says, if a cat has babies in an oven, you don't call the babies biscuits. <laughs> All of a sudden, where you're born, makes more where you just give me a break. Slaves were born on ships. We had babies on ships, on slave ships. What does it make the baby a slave shipping? We are Africans, and we must come to be proud of being Africans. And the only way we can be proud of being Africans is when we have knowledge of Africa. Hear me well. Pride has nothing to do with foolhardy sentiment. It has everything to do with knowledge. So our pride must be rooted and grounded in knowledge. We don't understand what the problem is about this question of Africa. We know that if you plant corn in Africa, if you plant corn in the Soviet Union, if you plant corn in America, you get corn. What makes you think if you plant Africans in Africa and you plant them in America, you don't get the same Africans? This makes no logical sense at all. We used to play with people. You mean, if an African man, African woman has a baby in Africa, what's the child? African. If an African man, African woman has a baby in China, what's the child? African. If an African man, African woman has a baby in Russia, what's the child? African. If an African man, African woman has a baby in Greenland, what's the child? African. If an African man, African woman have a baby in Japan, what's the child? African. If an African man, African woman has a child in America, what's the child? I'm an American. <laughs> We're Africans, brothers and sisters. We're Africans and we have every reason to be proud of what we are and we say this pride must be based in knowledge thus we come to impose upon you a responsibility a responsibility to know your history a responsibility to know who you are it is only when you know who you are that you will know what your interests are 
Since we do not know we're Africans and we think we're Americans, that's why we are so loyal to the American capitalist system. I mean, nobody loves America like us. I mean, all America got to say is she going to war and we pick up the gun, Jack. Where? Baghdad. Which way is it? That way. Give me the gun. Let's swim. Yeah. Look at the contradictions. We love America more than any other nationality in the country, and we are more oppressed by America than every other nationality in the country. In the country. These contradictions can only exist when you don't know who you are and think America is your only country. As a matter of fact, Africans figure, well, America is all we know, so like it or not, good or bad, we got to take it. You must create alternative plans always when you face an enemy. You must not take the enemy's plan. You must make your own. Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. The richest. When Africa is properly organized, she'll be the most powerful continent on the face of the earth. The most powerful. It is only power that will redress our problem, nothing else. It is only power that will redress our problem. The reason why we suffer the way we do, even today, is because we're powerless. I mean, they make us look so pathetic that it's, it's really helpless. In 1965, the Africans in Watts rebelled. They rebelled, every right to rebel. When they rebelled, they shocked America with their violence. They shocked themselves. If we do that, mm -hmm. When they rebelled in 1965, a white man, Yorty, was mayor, for all practical purposes, a racist. In 1992, they rebelled again. When they rebelled in 1992, an African, Tom Bradley, was their mayor. He had come up through the ranks of the police in Los Angeles. He was a lieutenant in the police force. It was for the good work he did in suppressing us in the 1965 rebellion that he became mayor of Los Angeles. You must know your history. You must know your history. We say the Africans rebelled in 65 and they rebelled in 92. When they rebelled in 92, Tom Bradley was their mayor. Look at how powerless he was. Look at the wump he was. He could not even stop the terrorism of the police force against this, which he knew, since after all, he was a police in it. I know the terrorism of the police force of Los Angeles when I was a young man as a Black Panther Party member. They are racist pigs. I know that. They were then and they're worse now. Bradley couldn't stop them. Not only could he not stop them, he couldn't redress acts of injustice. As a matter of fact, when the decision about Rodney King came down, he sounded just like Rodney King's mother. Ah, they gave us a raw deal. <laughs> You're the mayor. But this mayor is totally powerless, just like all the other African mayors in the country. Totally powerless. You know why they're powerless? Because Africans are not organized. You know why we're not organized? Because we think we're Americans just like the others. This is where confusion arises. I don't see how Africans could think they're Americans when everything we get in America, we pay for with our blood. I mean everything. I mean everything. If you want to ride on a bus, though you pay the same money like everybody else, want to ride where you want to ride, you got to shed your blood. If you want to live in a neighborhood in Chicago, in the suburbs, even though you got enough money, just like white folk, you got to shed your blood. Don't think it's a class problem. If you want to send your child to school where you pay taxes, you got to shed your blood. If you want to get the vote, which every immigrant gets the minute they come here, you've got to shed your blood. Nobody sitting in this room can give me one example where an African has advanced even on the individual basis, which was not at the price of the shedding of blood of the masses of the people. These are facts. The Italians don't shed their blood for nothing. In America, the Irish don't shed their blood for anything. Nobody else sheds their blood for anything except us. We shed our blood for everything, and we're the first to join the melting pot. Contradictions here must be looked at properly and severely understood. The reason why we want to forget the shedding of blood is because we want to be American so quickly. And we think the more blood we shed, the quicker we become American. How silly. How totally silly. 
If shedding blood was to make us American, that they arrive at through the blood of their people, then these Africans will use these positions to advance their people's struggle. Bradley would come to understand that the position of mayor doesn't belong to him, it belongs to his people. Understanding that his people shed blood to get that office, he cannot now come and play mayor like Yorty. Yorty can play politics and play games, but no African can play politics and play games with politics because it costs our blood to advance. Therefore, Bradley must come to know his people's history. He must come to know that the position which he occupied was occupied by his people's blood. And if it takes his blood to advance the people, so be it with the greatest honor. Thus, if Bradley understood his position, when the division went down, if he was true to the people's struggle, since the people were throwing bricks and bottles, he would have been the first one in the streets throwing bricks and bottles with the masses of his people. We must understand history. It is that which imposes responsibilities upon us. Africa is our home. Africa is our only home. You can say whatever you want to say, but I know your culture is African. Matter of fact, when I saw the Najwa dancers here, it came quickly to my mind. Oh, it's true what they say. You can take an African out of Africa, but you can never take Africa out of the Africa. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was in Africa when I saw them dancing. Because I live in Africa, I see this dance all the time. I say, oh yeah, you see, they can't forget it. Even if you think you forget it, you can't forget it. Once your history has made a mark upon you, you can't forget it, even if you think you forgot it. You are defined by your culture, and your culture is African culture. We said it's only when we understand our identity, who we are, that we'll understand what our interests are. We will see our particular history. Let me give you two examples before we conclude. All women, all women all over the world are oppressed. All women. Everywhere. Societies which are conscious of this form women organizations and give the women this weapon, organization, because organization is the weapon of the oppressed. Organization is the weapon of the oppressed. They give the women organization so they can fight with it. If you go to Cuba, you'll find a women's organization there, paid for by the government, given all power to fight against sexist abuse. If you go to Tanzania, a socialist country, you'll find a women's organization there, supported by the government to fight against sexism. Because all societies are oppressed. All of societies oppress their women. And Africans oppress their women. We oppress them. The African woman is oppressed on every level, from the physical to the ideological. Some of our brothers are so backwards that they actually beat the producers of our nation, abuse them physically. Thus, our women are oppressed. But while our women are oppressed, like every other woman, our women do not take the same path of history to oppression. And this must be properly understood. Africa, even during the times of feudalism, presented the first queens to the world. And these queens were presented be centuries before any other continent or country gave queens to the world. Dr. Henry Clark has a little pamphlet which documents the role of these queens. And he shows us through proper documentation that when an African queen was underthrown, every time an African queen was underthrown, Africa advanced technologically, scientifically, socially, economically, politically, in every way. He further properly shows through his documentation that if a queen was on the throne and Africa was invaded, there was no compromise at all. None whatsoever. We say Africa produced the very first queens in the world, but today African women are oppressed. Consequently, African women will know what other women may not know, that oppression of women is not endemic or innate to African society. This is crucial in their understanding. We say, and it's a fact, that we can oppress our women everywhere. You know, some people who don't know their culture, taking the culture of the oppressor, come to make analysis of our struggle. I hear stupid statements all the time. In the 1960s, sisters played no role in the movement. Where are you reading that from? Where were you? We can oppress our women everywhere as African men, but the one place we cannot oppress our women is on the front lines fighting for us. If you will take a cursory glance at the history of Africa, you will see African, Af African has produced more 
African has produced more female warriors than probably any other race of people. I speak not just of Queen Nzinga, who fought the Portuguese for 40 years at the head of her troops. I bring you all the way down today to Asata Shaku, head of the Black Liberation Army. You know Asata Shaku, no? How many of you know Asata? Raise your hands. Oh, isn't that terrible? All right, let me give you a little bit of news that you don't get on CNN. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but I know you think you're in television. Let me tell you about a beautiful sister, a beautiful sister who's alive and you need to know. Her name is Asata Shaku. And she has a book, and the book is entitled Asata, A-S-S-A-T-A. -S you know, y'all need to read. You know, y'all need to read. Y'all need to stop looking at television so much and pick up a book and put something in your head that'll help advance your people's struggle. So I encourage you to read this book of Saturday. It's about a sister. And since you all say sisters, they never play no role in the struggle, you should read a book. A Saturday was a member of the Black Panther Party. And when for her the Black Panther Party was taking a turn which she considered was irreversible towards reform and revisionism, she left the Black Panther Party with a number of others. And they formed the Black Liberation Army. The Black Liberation Army, they didn't play. They used to roll hand grenades on the police cars. That's a fact. They used to attack police stations. They used to assassinate racist police, yes. And the leader of the Black Liberation Army was Asata Shaku. The FBI had her on their 10 most wanted list for years, looking everywhere for her. And she was right in New York dealing on them. Yes. In her book, she explains how she made an error, and that in making this error, she came into a shootout with the police. Her husband was killed. Her brother, Sudiata Cody was wounded, and she herself was wounded. I'll never forget that day. The FBI came on television and they just danced like some punks. We got her. We got the Black Liberation Army. We've got a Sata Shaku. We've got the leader. We got the soul. It's over. We got her. They tortured her, as you can imagine. They tortured that sister, but Asada, she's a warrior. She's a warrior. They condemned her to life imprisonment. They promised the whole world. They built a special jail for her in New Jersey. And they told the entire world that this is where she was staying. She wasn't coming out. Do you know that the Black Liberation Army, under the orders of Asati Shaku, broke into the jail, broke her out of the jail, took her to Cuba, and that's where she is to this very day. You must know your history. <laughs> you must know your history. Once you know your history like this, you'll be a sister. You won't be afraid of no jail. Brothers will break you out. <laughs> yes. And uh, when I was in Cuba in 1990, the sister and I, she's just as beautiful as ever, just as powerful as ever, stronger than ever before. You don't even know your heroes. How can you know it if you do not know your history? And Asata is your living history. We say African women are warriors. That's when African women come to fight for their liberation, their path will be different from others. In our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, we have the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Every sister in our party must be a member of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Our party created the All African Women's Revolutionary for our sisters because we know our sisters are oppressed. There is no All African Men's Revolutionary Union in our party and there never will be. Men oppress women. If you want to redress the problem, you disorganize men and you organize women. And since we have no reason not to have faith in our sisters, there's no reason at all why we do not give them the full confidence of our party. When brothers mumble in the party to them, shut up. Our sisters are fighters. They organize themselves. You can sit down. They can take the enemy on by themselves. Yes. So we give just, two, just an example of women's culture in Africa, which is different. If you don't know your history, knowing that you had the first queens, you might think that you're like all other women. Your history is important. One other point. Africans in America must thank themselves because they have done a great deal for this country. I mean, when I see the changes in this country since the 60s, I know it's Africans who did it. The other day, in having a discussion with a little young white man, he had some long hair. He said, they talk about the 60s so much, and they said that you did so much. Well, what did you do anyway? I looked at him, I said, hmm. I made it possible for you to wear long hair. <laughs> in 
the 1960s, if you'd have tried to wear long hair, they'd have lynched you just like they lynched me. <laughs> yes. All the changes in America from the 60s are a result of us. We were the only ones in the street. Nobody else was there except us. Us and us alone. When you were picketing in those days, they called you communists. Today, all of them are picketing. When you were making social unrest, they called you troublemakers. Today, all of them are in the streets. Thanks to you, you must know what you've done once you know your history. Since the 1960s, the people in America are more politicized than ever before. The capitalist system will try to confuse you. They run a game. Oh, the people are doing nothing. They're quiet. Everybody's into their own thing. Nobody's doing It's nothing but lies. The capitalist system doesn't lie some of the time. It lies all of the time. When it tells the truth, it's the result of a double lie. Yeah. It's a fact. It's a fact. Today, the American people are more politically conscious in every area. Thanks to you, they demonstrate about everything. The people are more conscious today of women's liberation. More, more conscious. People are more conscious today of the responsibility to struggle in every arena. The handicapped struggle. Everybody struggles. Busing people struggle, either for or against. Even for abortion, they have political struggles. The, the American people are more politicized today than ever before, thanks to you. One of these movements that came up, thanks to your struggle in the 60s, was one known as gay liberation. Our party, being a revolutionary party, studying all forces, looked carefully at it when it started in the early 70s. We paid no attention to it. We studied it, but we, paid no, we had no relations with it. We watched it. By the 1980s, they got strong. In the 1970s, they used to invite us to their activities. We never participated. In the 1980s, they got strong and uh, had so many other Africans running to them here and there. So after a while, they demanded a meeting with us. Well, we're a revolutionary party, and we meet with everyone. When they came to see us, you say you're revolutionary. We are. We are African revolutionaries. You say you fight against all discrimination. We do, from our cultural point of view. Well, we want to tell you that uh, you don't support us at all. You don't do nothing for us. We don't see you never coming to, coming to our... You never see us coming. They named all the other Africans who came. We told them, we're not running for nothing in the Democratic Party. Yes, then we, ain't, we don't even want a piece of the American pie. Yes, then we are revolutionaries. We want to burn the pie up to the crust. You understand? <laughs> Let them Africans who want a piece climb up on your back. We don't want anything. They really got upset. We informed them, listen. We are African revolutionaries. Unlike the others, we know our culture. We know our history, and we fight from our culture. If you will look at the history of Europe, you will see that of this question of homosexuality, European culture is most intolerant. I mean, from the Greeks all the way down to today, they've always been bashing in the heads of homosexuals and killing them. It's endemic to the culture of Europe. African culture is most tolerant. As a matter of fact, some people believe the reason we find ourselves in the conditions we do today is because we're so tolerant. I explained to them that we in the African community do not have this problem. We do not bash the brains of homosexuals in. I told them, bashing in the brains of homosexuals in our community is as alien as lynching a white man. It's just not in our culture. I explained to them, I said, you may not know anything about our culture, but if you will look at our culture, if you look at our community, in our community, the hardest organization against homosexuality is the Nation of Islam. You'll hear Minister Farrakhan say, you better tell them to straighten up their wrist. I said, but that's as far as it will go. Minister Farrakhan himself knows that James Baldwin was a homosexual. He never hid it. Nobody in our community hid it. What was there to hide from? You understand? Nobody was hitting you, doing anything to you. And uh, this James Baldwin, even Minister Farrakhan, thanks him for his contribution he made to the people's struggle. Nobody in our community asked James Baldwin what, his what was his relationship to the means of reproduction. We just asked him, what contribution did you make to the people's struggle? Thank you. That's all there is to that. I explained to them, I remember when I was a young a youth in Harlem, a tough youth, that all the homosexuals of Harlem used to put up leaflets all over the town when they had their trans, transvestite ball every year. And all the homosexuals in Harlem would come together at the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm was assassinated or at Rockland Palace and we would go there and they would dress up and we were young toughs and all we could do was lean against the wall and say, are you sure that one is a man? She sure looks fine. <laughs> 
That's about the best we could do with that. Nobody thought of smashing their brains. I even told them, the word faggot and the word punk in our community doesn't have the same connotation that it has in your culture. When I said, you ought to stop using the word punk. To who? In my community? We've been using it since I was a child. You're a punk. That don't mean nothing. In your community, it has a different cultural aspect. We've just shown you two examples why your history is necessary to show you your culture so that you will not get confused with the enemy. We must conclude. Of course, in concluding, we cannot but tell you that you must come to be proud of Africa. We cannot but tell you that you're nothing else but Africans, that you will never be anything else but Africans. Because Mother Africa is so strong, when she puts a stamp on you, 400 years of cold weather, Nat and Nola, and frying your hair will never disguise you. <laughs> Matter of fact, Mother Africa wants you so much that even when you fry your hair, she's coming right back and snatching it up. <laughs> no. <laughs> no chance for you, it's natural. <laughs> I mean, that's really, that's a real perm now, don't get confused, not to temp, yes. <laughs> yes. You must come to be proud of Africa. It is only when you're proud of who you are that you can know precisely what your interests are and fight for them uncompromisingly so. You must come to know that you're Africans because it's only when Africa is free that we will be free. I organized for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Ours is a revolutionary party. We've already told you we don't want a piece of the American pie. Others can fight for it. We want to burn it up because that pie is filled with nothing but blood and filth from the rape and of the entire world. See, America is the richest country in the world. She ought to be. She's the biggest thief in the world. It's just logical. We say that the only solution to our problems is Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. If you knew your culture, you would know the values of Africa is that of a socialist system even to this day. This is the solution. You may not agree with us. There's no problem here. We tell you if you don't agree with us, that's fine. We'd like you, of course, to come and investigate and see whether or not it's true. So we'll ask you to come, look at our party. We have a table out here. Interested, we want you to join our party because we want to organize our people. That's the only road to victory. If you don't join our party, we tell you what we always tell you. If you don't join our party, you better join another organization working for your people. Because the only way you'll get your history is from another organization giving you a history. If you see a member of the Nation of Islam, I bet you he knows his history. If you see a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, I bet you she knows her history. If you see a member of the, uh, the National Association for the Answer of Colored People, I bet you know the history as they get it from the organization. The only ones who do not know the history is those who are not in any organization at all. It is time for you to come and organize your people. It is time for you to come and be proud of your people. Until you're proud of what you are, you will never be anything other than what the enemy wants you to be. Africa is our home. We are Africans. Stand up and be proud. Thank you. Ready for the revolution. <laughs>